Here we go then, folks. Back in for episode 14-14 this time of the Silly Goose Gang podcast. And joining us tonight is... I've thought long and hard about this intro, Andy, for the last couple of days, and I think I'm going to have to go with Renaissance man, Andy <laughs> Torbett. Um, like looking, looking at your list of accolades, I put, if I miss anything, shout them out. But we've got 10 years in the British Army in the Parachute Regiment, a cave diver, technical diver, skydiver, speed skydiving, which we'll definitely have to come back on, <laughs> qualified flight martin expedition leader, degree in zoology, diploma in nautical archaeology, working towards a master's in archaeology. You've done 22 TV series, 250 articles, and one book, Andy Torbett's Extreme Adventures, which I was lucky enough to get a signed copy of a couple of years back. Thank you very much for that, Andy. Uh, presenter of Fully Charged, have I missed anything? No, the, I, the God knows. Uh, the only thing I'd say is, um, whereas the forces, it wasn't the parachute regiment, I was a paratrooper, but I was, uh, oh, right, okay. I, was, I, was sorry, I was bomb disposal, so I was airborne commando in SF, bomb disposal, high research, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like that, that over, because people, I get asked a lot, so, you know, people say, you know, what do you do for a living? Or if you do a podcast, because I've done quite a few podcasts, obviously lockdown, you know, um, yeah. they've said, uh, you know, how would you describe yourself? It's like, I don't know, because I do a lot of different so, stuff to pay the mortgage, so you know? It's, it's, it's quite it's quite weird when somebody says to describe yourself. That's kind of weird. That's, you know, you let somebody, you let somebody yeah. introduce you like that. Because you, you wouldn't go, you know, I'm Andy Torbert. I am this, I do this, and I do that. It's about, uh, that's a bit weird. You let other people do that. Even folks say, so what do you do for a living? You're like, well, what I physically get paid for and, and what I... Because, like, obviously... Effectively writing articles, but I'm not a journalist. I wrote a book. I'm not an author. You know, I do some talks. I'm not a proper public speaker. I do a lot of TV stuff, but I wouldn't of a proper presenter in the kind of you know proper BBC presenter. And then, uh, because, but all those things are based on the fact that I do cave diving, free diving, and uh, rock climbing and skydiving. That so it's probably. But then sometimes I'll do stuff where I'm skydiving, but talking about peregrine falcons. So that's my zoology. So. It's a mix, but actually, I never thought. But I liked, I like the open line because I keep saying to people, you know, these days, especially like Instagram accounts or or TV personas, whatever you want to call it, it's all about the brand. What's your brand? What are you? Are you the yeah. wildlife guy or are you the survival guy? Like all of us are more than one thing, you know. Yeah. I, I, you know, you can you can be a climber and a skydiver and a diver, and yeah. you can be into you can be into wildlife and technology. Like fully charged, a good example which the folk don't know because it's, it's, it's a YouTube channel that does electric vehicles and, and sustainable energy and sort of green green issues. But it's run by, for those of a certain age, it's run by Robert Llewellyn, who you'll probably know best mm. from either, either Scrap Heap Challenge or Crichton from right, Red Dwarf. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Um, so, you know, you like, you get guys like him, like, you know, you can be into like wildlife and nature and cutting edge technology. They don't have to be. So, um, yeah, race once, Mark. I quite, I quite like. I'll, I'll take that one. That's, thanks very much. You can have that. Yeah, I'm going to go and change my Instagram profile now. Hey! <laughs> you get on business, Mark. <laughs> Andy Torbert, yeah. race once, Mark. Well, genuinely, when I like ten years ago, I got business cards printed. That's the first way I've done it. But I just, I, you know, I put on there my name, my email address, and my telephone number, and that was it. Because I thought I don't I have no idea. Because at the time, you know, I was doing this stuff, but I was still supporting myself and doing other work, like the old X Forces work. Um, you know, in the West Africa and the Middle East, and and a bit of commercial diving as well, and that sort of stuff. So I was kind of like, I'll kind of, I'll kind of do what's going. You know, what I mean, you, you've got to be careful in this game not to just just do one thing because, yeah, you know, jobs in the adventure world or the media they, they peak in trough. You know, you've got you've got good times and bad times. You've got to ride the ride the uh, ride the the bad times, um, which is how Bond came along. To be honest, because I, I don't know if you. I, I don't. I actually forgot. I actually scribbled it down. I think and forgot to mention that you've done stunt work for James Bond films as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. That just was, that just was... to add to the cool. Right. Just to add to in case anyone didn't think you were I'll, already cool ass. We'll I'll, just I'll, go in the you, fact you, that you stunted in James <laughs> Bond. If you could, if you could, if you could just finish all this off and find a cure for cancer and COVID nineteen and just call it quits. You know what are you waiting on? Well, because then. <laughs> Yeah, like another guy, girl. Actually, the closest thing I've done that I, I think the closest thing I think I've done, although James Bond is quite cool because I'm a big Bond fan, but um, I did the voice for Action Man a few years ago. For the, um, so oh, for right. Action, 
for Action Man's 50th anniversary, oh. the BBC made this little stop at what well, was a film, but it was a sort of semi, it was a stop animation film. So Action Man the toy went out into the real world to find out where he came from, like 50 years or that, anyway. And um, they asked me to, because it was for the one show, so I do stuff for the one show. So they said, oh, well, would you, we thought you could be the guy to, to voice it over. And I was like, so, uh, but we're, we're, a, we're a bit short of time. Will you be free in the next? Yes, I'm free. Well, you know, no, no matter what's on, I'll, no matter where you're doing it, I'll come to you I'll and I'll it. do the voiceover. And um, afterwards, because obviously, you know, it's 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 a national programme and there's quite a few people, you know, coming. Um, I, I I didn't know Action Man spoke with a Scottish accent. And I was like, well, <laughs> well, mine did. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Action Man doesn't speak the Scottish accent. Every Action Man in Scotland speaks the Scottish accent, I guarantee you. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, That's tremendous. Aye, that might be Action Man probably is on par, if not maybe cooler than James Bond. I would agree on that one. Well, I, I, I kind of got to effectively play Action Man as opposed to, I was never actually, you know, Daniel Craig clearly would have been something to say if I'd been, do you mind if I just do this? Uh, no, uh, you know what I mean. Fair one. Fair one. <laughs> Now the thing, the question is, is when you're working out in this uh, this fabulous looking gym that you've got, do you pretend that you are Action Man? <laughs> no, uh, I I usually exactly opposite. Training for me is all about trying to not hurt myself anymore, any worse than I already yeah. am. Because I mean, from you know, ten years in the forces doing what I did, like you know, from the military dive stuff, the stuff in the Marines, the para course, SF stuff. You know, I've got. My knees are shot away. I've got bolts in my shin. I've got two tears in my shoulders permanent. I've broke my back when I was 20. I'm not two. What year was it? I don't know. Anyway, early 20s. Um, so, you know, I'm a bit I'm a bit banged up. So, you know, I'm, I'm training now. And a lot of it is about almost conservation. You know, occasionally you have a time you get in the gym and you smash it. But most times what you're actually trying to do is still be able to operate tomorrow. You know, um, well, well, we've had these conversations before with a couple of guys that's been on here before, and we are all, you know, getting older. So one of the things that we always say, you know, if you go and do a gym set, you know, if you go and do a squat, you know, a squat session or a deadlift session, whatever you're doing, and and you do so much that you can't be functional the next day, then the session's pretty stupid. You, you've kind of wasted your time. You know, if you can't if you can't do anything the next day because your legs are so sore. Yeah, it's, 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 it's all about. Yeah. So for me, it's all about consistency. You know, you're you're better off putting in eighty percent effort seven days a week. Actually, yeah. you know, eighty percent effort over the next six months, than one hundred percent effort every day over the next three weeks, and then you then you get injured and you're off yeah. the next three weeks. So you, yeah, yeah. And again, with myself, because I I, I mean, less than less, you know, a bit often. You know, you get a phone call and go, "Can you go and film this tomorrow?" Or can you and you. You, know, yeah. you don't always know what's happening, so you don't want to leave the gym and be unable to go and like do so many pull ups that, that tomorrow you can't climb and then you're supposed to do a climbing yeah. shoot. I say we're doing stunts because we were on stunts, we had a gym set up in the stunt shed at Pinewood, and everyone trained because it's all very motivated, fit uh, men and women. But you also had to think about what you're doing that day. And yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. Well, I, I can't smash it because I'm not being paid to smash at the gym, I'm being paid to turn up set and do the job they're paying me to do. And that's that's the priority. Um, so, yeah. So then do you do, are you doing, do you do a lot of um, kind, of, kind of mobility work and stuff then, Andy, to keep yourself yeah. kind of limber yeah. and loose? Yeah, a lot of mobility yeah. stuff. Yeah, more and more these these days. You know, definitely how, how I train, how I recover, how I eat is different now to when I was in my 20s. A, because yeah. I was in the forces, and I was like, when you're in the forces, you eat what you're given, you 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 train how you're told to train, and you drink a great deal of alcohol. Um, uh, except then you say, except when you're on tour, you know, you go to a rat for six months, you don't drink a drop for six months, so that's that's pretty good. Um, and you can work on your tan, at least from the elbows down and the neck up. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I mean, I've 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 become far more appreciative in the last year or two of because um, I trained for. For like performance or at least you know for capability you know in the real world so it's 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 yeah. it's that kind of fitness rather than run aesthetics although i always tell people if you train for aesthetics often what happens is you look good but you can't do much if you train yeah, yeah, for yeah. performance you can you tend to can do a lot and you used to look pretty fit as well because i mean you don't find many genuinely fit capable people who don't look fit and capable you know mm. 
I mean, Usain Bolt doesn't train for aesthetics, but that guy yeah. is ripped and massive. You know, that's just yeah, that's yeah. How he's some, some, for yeah it's a byproduct of doing that work. Yeah. So yeah. What, how do you? Um, so is, is there any difference in doing um, the way you train, or you know, kind of gym work? Is there any difference in, in general? Kind of outside, or you know, towards diving. Do you do anything different for diving or anything? Sorry for lung capacity, like, you know, for, for any of that kind of stuff. Is there any difference? No, no. I mean, diving is a pretty much psychological sport. Uh, as far as once you're underwater, um, I mean, being being fit and healthy helps your survival chances as far as your your ability to deal with, um, you know, de- decompression and that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, you know, being unfit and gaining too much body fat does have risks for pulmonary edemas and and um, immersion pulmonary edema and decompression. And some of these. Uh, this is probably nonsense to most folk, but it's some of these diving related kind of issues that can happen. Um, but it's not it's not a, that a physical sport once you're underwater. It's all about skills mm. and sort of psychology. Especially cave diving is very psychological based. That said, some cave diving, especially where you're having to trek into the mountains to find the caves or do a lot of dry caving, which is humping dive, which uh, always okay. time through dry caves up and down ropes, that's physical. I mean, the UK, a place like Florida or Mexico, you can drive up in your pickup truck to a, a cave, which is basically a pool in the in the jungle floor. You can just kit, put your kit on, you know, in the back of your truck and just step out straight into the water. So you can be a fat cave diver, frankly, if, in Florida. Um, in the UK, all the caves in the UK um, are a bit of a bit of a yomp from the nearest kind of car park, and often require a lot of dry caving to get. Bits of it, so you know you don't find many one, unfit cave divers. It's, um, it's one of the things cave diving. Just looking at it, it I'm just te- a fact. Most of the things that you do, are things that terrify me. So yeah, cave diving and, and and skydiving and all this kind of stuff is. What's quite funny is I've had um, I've had times that I've been climbing on rows and moan, and you know when you're in the you know in a hell of the, you know the weather starts turning, and it gets kind of misty and foggy and it gets a bit eerie. I've seen me thinking about how I'm going to fight off a big cat. <laughs> if a big cat, upon, you know, when you start, you start getting a yeah, bit yeah. It's, yeah. You go, how, how would I fight off a big cat? I'm thinking about that. But if somebody said to me, would you like to go and dive in a cave? I'd be like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not jumping out of a plane either. But I'll fight but, a big cat. I'll think about how I'm going to do it. But jumping out of a plane yeah. or going in a cave, no oh. way. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about it in the last episode, me and Chris, because I used to sky, um, I used to scuba dive and surf and free dive back when I was a little bit younger, Andy. And we were talking, and Chris was like, "Nope, because there's things in the sea that touch it, and we don't like that." Well, I think cave diving, as Chris was saying, that's that must be a different level. I was just saying, almost the psychological preparation over the physical. Yeah, it's definitely it's both psychological and it's it's basically risk management, you know, um, and. It's no more dangerous than anything else. Oh, well, that's not true. It's, it's, well, I think it starts off, I mean, it's, it's horrendously dangerous at the start, but the whole point is then to make it safe. So it's a bit like, also, it's like crossing the road. Crossing the road, is that safe or dangerous? Well, it depends on how you do it. You know, if you do mm. it at night in the rain, with your hands and knees, with your eyes closed, dressed as a ninja, you're going to get hit by a bus. If you do it in the daylight with a high vis vest, you, know, you look both ways, green cross code, you're going to be absolutely fine. In cave diving is the same. Like, I go cave diving all the time, my mates, and we don't think, oh, my God, we could die. No, we don't do that at all. We, obviously, we, we, you know, this is where paranoia and cautious, being cautious counts. Like, I, you know, I am not mm. an adrenaline junkie. I am not, I've not got a death wish. I, you know, I'm not a maniac. I'm, I'm paranoia is your friend. Because um, what we'll do is, we like, like you're saying there about, what would I do for a big cat attack? Like, that's the same thing I do. Because I do at home. You know, sat at home where I mug a tea in my pants and go right. Let's cave dive right. So let's see what could what's all the things that could possibly go wrong. And you let your imagination run wild and you list them all down and you go right. Now can I prevent? Can I guarantee any of them happening? And the, most of the ch- answers no. You don't have any guarantees. Okay. So what can I do to reduce the risks to the minimal? Right. You get that point. And then you say right. Am I now happy with that risk? And it kind of depends. If it's something that maybe ends up you stubbing your toe, that's ah, fine. If it ends up killing you, then you're like, no, even if it's a million to one, I'm not happy. So what you then do is you assume that's going to happen and you mm. have a plan in place. So 
the thing I use in my uh, up for underwater is called a rebreather. It's it's not normal scuba gear. It basically recycles one breath, so you can you can dive for like hours and hours and hours and hours at any depth. It's the same technology they use for for doing spacewalks, the astronauts. Um, All right, okay. And and it's never failed. I've, I've used loads of different systems, and in the last ten years, not one single failure. And yet, I assume it will fail every single time I dive, and I carry backup systems to to change onto, because should it fail, I'm dead. Because that's the one thing about cave diving over, say, climbing or even skydiving, is that you know you can, you can, you can scuff your toe, twist an ankle, break a leg, break your back, be in a coma, die in climbing a skydiving. You know, the, the things can go wrong, and it's a bit of a, there's an uphill graduation of how bad it can go. With cave diving, no one gets injured cave diving. Either it goes fine, and you're fine. It goes badly, but you fix it, and it, you're fine. Or it goes badly, you don't fix it, and you're dead. It's pretty binary cave diving. So, <laughs> um, which is why you want to say you want to go right. Can I guarantee you this bad thing's not going to go wrong? No. Okay. So I'll put things in place, and you know we, like most divers, dive the torch. A cave diver dives the torch, and then a backup torch, and then at least a backup backup torch. Normally we've got like five torches we dive with, you know, because we're <laughs> you don't want to be blind underwater. So, mm. um, and we've got a very good like. Cave diving is becoming incredibly safe. Like the people who are doing it, most cave divers that have died, or no, most divers that have died in a cave in the last ten years have not been cave divers. The people who had no qualifications or experience or the right kit and shouldn't have been in there in the first place. Yeah, um, but that's, that's like um, a lot of guys who you know just it just before lockdown with some tourists, I believe, killed on uh, on just coming down Nevis. Um, yeah. or, or where they killed them, they just rescued. I think they were just I think they were just rescued actually, but they had on just normal trainers. Nothing with them, no kit, nothing. Um, and those are the people, like you're saying, that you know, cave diving that, that get hurt. Those are the people that cause cause the the issues. Um, it's sort of like I think I believe Everest. Everest is now the same as well. You know, there's a lot of kind of rich Americans and Chinese people, and and they're just throwing money at things to try and they're in no condition to go up Everest. And that's you know, people are now getting hurt. Well, it happens every year in Scotland. Every year, I mean, the the met rescue guys in Scotland are flat out, and it's 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 very seldom. Mountaineers or climbers that are rescued from Ben Nevis, yeah. like yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's normally tourists who shouldn't have been there, you know. And the problem is, that I've done it. I've I've walked off Ben Nevis uh, in like uh, end of February, and it was a whiteout at the top. There's actually a guy I met who he was a, he got lost. He went up there. He was used to the Alps. So he used to good calm weather, and he got up there. He hadn't got a map or a compass. This is obviously a lot. This is like 20 years ago, uh, when people still use maps and compasses, and um. So he's an experienced mountaineer, but he'd always done it in the Alps where if you got good weather, you'd good weather for days and days and days, unlike Scotland, as we know. Yes. So anyway, I got him, picked him up, we went, we're went. we going down, but the problem is you get to some one point down the old pony track, and uh, yeah, yeah. and um, it, it gets really, it was quite a nice day down below. So you'd folk coming up in trainers and shorts, you know, and I'm there like, you know, so my Gore-Tex, crampon strapped to the top of my, my, my rock sack, my, my ice sack, just... It, you know, and they're looking at me like I'm, you know, just come up from outer space. It's going, guys, you, you won't. It, actually, luckily, it's fine because they won't get up there because it was so icy. You, you wouldn't have got up yeah, there yeah. crampons on. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, that's yeah, a lack of preparedness. We had um, there's actually a video came up on Facebook Memories. I think it was uh, yes, it must have been the 16th, so it'd been Saturday. Um, and it was uh, you know, we had went up uh, five years ago up uh, Ben Nevis it was for somebody's stag do, and uh, so that was 16th of May. And I've, I've got a video from the top, and it is wild, absolutely wild, snowing really heavily, ice. We never made it to the top, because we got to the stage where you're on a sheet, and you go, I don't know what's underneath this ice, so let's just call it and, and go back down. But it's super easy for people just to go, no, we'll just keep going. I think we'll be, it's only a Monroe, I think we'll be fine. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's about, is it 1,300 metres, roughly, give or take? Yeah, something like that, yeah. And you lose you lose roughly a degree of temperature for every hundred meters you go up. So you're at, you're down in Glen Nevis. Oh, it's quite a nice day, or it's it's gonna say sixteen degrees Celsius. Oh, fair. But once I start walking, I'll get a bit of heat. Oh, you know, but that means on the top, it's getting close to, to zero. You know, and yeah, that's yeah. not including wind chill. It's like you know, I've seen ninety mile an hour winds at the top of Ben Nevis. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't be wrong. I've been I've been up there one day with my mum. It's the only day I ever had a day where it's clear. Summer's day. We got up there. We left like two in the morning. It's got for sunrise, and you can see forever. It was a clear day, and, and you know I've only ever had that once. We could see forever, and it was you know a breath of wind. It was beautiful. 
But mm. I was like, Jesus, these are this is this is once in a lifetime. Really? Um, it's funny because yeah. we're talking about that. We we're talking about that on um, yesterday, actually. Sorry, with Johnny on Ali, and we're talking about this. And you know, I've done the Ring of Steel. Have you have you done the Ring of Steel, Andy? No, it came no, off no. I know it, but no. Yeah, and, yeah. And I got we got to the top. It was a beautiful day, and um, it was in a race. So I, we, I got to the top. I can't remember the last Monroe, and the sun was coming down, just coming down. Uh, and I've never seen anything like it in my life. I took a yeah, panoramic picture, and it's absolutely unbelievable. Just coming down, you see all the tops, and it's just beautiful. If if you don't mind a little, a little very, very very low level technical climbing, but if you're all right to like like for those who climb it, it would be moderates and V dis and one, one half severe, and that's about it. But the Coolin Ridge, I did the Coolin Ridge in a day a few years ago, uh, yeah. up in Sky. That is the most spectacular mountain scenery I've seen. And I, I, I waited and waited and waited until I got a day that was completely clear. Well, uh, so July, bright sunshine. I mean, baking hot, Jesus. But, you know, I could see the last peak from the first when I set off at like five in the morning. And, and yeah, it, it is it's it is like being like, in the Alps. It's how, it, it sounds it's amazing. like, um, I, I, I do basically what you do, Andy. I do, when I, I, I usually go try and go to Sky once a year. I just leave on a Sunday morning at three o'clock in the morning, try and get up there for sorry, 8 o'clock, climb on my own, come home. But I always look at the, I, I sorry, you know, usually around about this time and look at the weather forecast and say, when are we going to get a good weekend? And you get a Saturday or Sunday that's gorgeous, you go, that's the day I'm going. And, um, but yeah, I, I, if I'm going to, you know, a general Monroe, I'll go either sunrise or sunset and try and get, you know, one or the other yeah. on the right day. Well, I was, it's unbelievable. I was, my start time was driven by, uh, I knew I had to get up above the midgy line before the midges came out. Genuinely, I was like, right, I'm gonna leave. I'll leave. I'll leave the car, the Glen Brittle campsite car park at like I think it was yeah, two yeah. or half two in the morning. I thought, right, it's not about when I get to the first peak to start. It's about when I know that roughly that's the, the midges won't be much. The ten, the ten. Yeah. Like, come on, there's an altitude roughly. You won't get much midges. So I was like, I want to be up above that altitude before sort of five in the morning before sunrise because I don't. I, oh, midges, man, do me absolutely. <laughs> so what? Um, what I, I did. Um, like a true Scott. Yeah, did, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I did Scour Alistair and you start at um, Glen Biddle Car Park at the little camp as well. So yeah. I didn't have to do the, the cool and Ridge and I'll have to go the next time I've got to do that because I just did Scour Alistair, nipped into the ferry pool, sort of run around there and then go back down the road. So the next time I'll, I'll check out Cool and Ridge. So it's a big day, but it's, it's cracking. It's a real sense of achievement. Yeah. It's probably my second best sort of climbing mountain day out, to be honest. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've had. So, yeah. Yeah. Fairy, cool. fairy, fairy pools is a touchy subject in our house because we went up to Sky two years ago as a family. I've got three kids and uh, two teenage boys, and at, at the time, an eight year old daughter, she's now 10. And we decided we'd go and see the fairy pools. And we were staying in a uh, uh, Speen Bridge um, oh, and yeah, we yeah. drove across, parked up in the car park. Uh, and as always, it had started raining in the, the interim period and like washing down the rain as it does. So we'll jump out the car and it's like, fine, we've all got our jackets, opened the boot of the car, I pull out my jacket, pull out the wife's jacket, Aaron's, Logan's, where's Anya's jacket? Anya's face just dropped. I put it down as we were coming out the, the lodge and I've left it. And honestly, my wife lost the plot. She'll listen to this and she'll be tough. Like, absolutely. You know that moment where you just go, kids, just get back in the car for your own safety. And she drove off sky. Cursing and swearing all the way with me staring straight forward, the three <laughs> kids in the back, or the two boys saying nothing, and you sat in the middle sobbing and howling, and just no one talking for about the first 40 minutes because we had never been up to the fairy pool before and we never ever got to see it. It was just typical Scottish yeah. weather turned for us. If you have Honestly, to, um, mortified. She's never lived it down to this day, yeah. Fairy, the fairy pools have to be done it's super early because it gets crazy with tourists. If you go to the yeah. fairy pools, you, you, the time you get to nine o'clock in the morning, it's, you kind of get in the car park. So, um, so I, I, the, one of the things I wanted to, from your intro, Andy, was um, archaeology stuff. I've always, yeah. when, when I was at school, that's one of the things that I, I, I was fascinated by history at high school. Um, and archaeology was something I actually kind of thought about pursuing that at one point, but then I realised I went to work and I was lazy, so I didn't do it. Um, but yeah, what, so what what's, what kind of area are you? What what you? Is there like a period that, are, that you're kind of looking to get into? Or? You know, all sorts. So I did. I did when I was at uni. I went to uni for my joint forces, and and I uh, I did the first couple of years. I actually did zoology and archaeology, and then you had to specialize. You had to basically choose a proper subject. You couldn't do them both. So I went with zoology, and then um, 
I've also, you know, I've, I've, again, let's say, you know, you get your academic specialists, but every, like all the TV presenters who are wildlife guys, they've all, they also got other subjects they're interested in. You know, very mm. few people are just like, I, I only want to learn about one thing. So, um, <clears throat> And I'd done some work for some universities years ago as the dive supervisor on archaeology digs in Scotland and in Greece and places like that. Um, yeah. And it's really a lot. And then, so I did a TV BBC series um, up in Orkney. It's all about archaeology. So it was okay. myself, Shinny, uh, Neil Oliver, Chris Packham. And um, when I was there, as I usually am, I was the you know, adventure bloke. So I was doing climbing stuff and diving and sea kayaking. But... Um, you know, I, I get it quick because we've got, oh, we've got a script for you here just so you can describe this thing. I was like, oh, I don't need it. You know, this is this is the you know the bringing broadcast, blah blah blah, and the Neil thing. And like, oh, if you'd been doing some studying, so now oh, we cover this like in my university course, and that kind of re, kind of inspired. Oh, I should really. So it's so I start. I thought if I'm gonna if I'm gonna like go and do a course in archaeology, I might as well, you know, do a proper course and get a qualification out of it. So uh, you know, there wasn't any. I'm doing it for myself. There wasn't any kind of career step or uh, any agenda it was just mm. to be fair, it's, it's been more harder work and more work than i thought it would be but you know it's was it's a master's but um it's been interesting if, if, if struggling at times but um kind of out of the habit of of, of, of working but again it's been good because it's 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 made me kind of almost relearn how to actually i can learn how to study how to think again mm. um but yeah, so it's it's, yeah. But it's as far as areas, anything. I mean, I, what, what I like doing is, and I've done it in the past for projects, is using the skills I've got to, to and it, not just for archaeology, I've done it for, for biological science, the star base, for, for geology stuff, is is to, you know, use the cave diving and the deep technical diving, all the climbing stuff, to go and reach places that maybe the normal academics can't get to. So you can go there. Oh, yeah. You can bring back the data for them to for them to study because you know if, if there's a if there's a shipwreck at 120 meters, there's not that many archaeologists that can dive at 120 meters, or um, you know maybe zoologists who are willing to dive deep into caves to, to do some sampling. So you can do that for them. So I do enjoy enjoy that because you know I'm a far better cave diver than I am an academic, and will ever be. <laughs> sounds like a, that sounds like a TV program to me. <laughs> oh, I've pitched it. I've pitched it many, 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 many times. Well, well, you'll have one viewer. I'd love to watch that. I was going to say two viewers, two viewers. I'd be on <laughs> for viewers. that. So would Aaron. Think, Aaron's looking my to mom, do archaeology. So well, there's three, and my mum is four. So we've got four. I'll pitch it again. Four um, viewers. Yeah, I've got it. TV is TV is. Um, you know, I reckon uh, for every hundred ideas you pitch, and it'll take you. Yeah, you get you get one hit. I mean. I did a kids series. It was really successful. Very, did very, very well. And if I, it was like, oh my god, it was amazing. That took me eight years to get to get made, like to get good, good. make it. Uh, so then, yeah. this kind of segues nightly into into the um, the get charged um, YouTube thing. Is there, is there no hmm. way you could kind of start looking at doing that? You know that kind of thing on because YouTube now, is, I basically watch YouTube. That's pretty yeah. much what I watch yeah. now. Yeah, there's so much content and, and good content. Yeah, the funny thing is now, so fully charged uh, is it's the biggest kind of electric vehicle sustainable energy that you know thing on YouTube, um, and it's, it's a huge thing in the, in the states. Actually, it's huge in the states, mm. and um, you know I'm a bit old school, and if you'd asked me six months ago, I'd obviously you know rank the BBC over YouTube. That's not the case at all, and actually I should know better because um, I don't watch tv anymore like i've got an apple tv so i go and i watch like a series but i mm -hmm. might watch that series through the bbc app or the netflix app or the amazon app or the youtube app it's kind of irrelevant these mm -hmm. are and again you speak to like you know actually more not mates but kid, mates kids who are like 18 19 20 yeah they just watch youtube now they don't really watch the bbc yeah. and if they do they, they they don't see a difference between bbc because they, they, they see the bbc as an app the iPlay is an app because they don't, they don't, you know, BBC One, they don't know what BBC One is. So you go, you, if you want to watch a TV series, yeah. you go, you look for that TV series on the iPlayer, whether it was on BBC One or Two is irrelevant to them. So they see, you know, a, a successful YouTube channel uh, the same way you would see a successful BBC series. You just watch them two different apps. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, and they've, and they've got, and, and what I like about it, I've got to say, I really do like, one is the fact that 
you know, there is a genuine kind of positive purpose behind it. They are trying to, it's not just about the technology, it's about why, the, why we should be using this technology, i.e. we're trying to make the world a better place, we're trying to clean the world up. And have, having two small kids, that's becoming more and more important. You know, the, even when I was doing a lot of zoology and ecology and conservation stuff, it's still become, become more of an issue now. Cause, and it's not since I had kids, it's since my kids are three and five now, and I'm starting to do a lot more with them that you can actually kind of, you know, yeah. they're a bit more interesting now that they're older. And I can realise that, frankly, the world is not in a great state. And when they are 30 years old and I'm 60, they'll turn around to me and be like, you must have known what you were doing. You must have known. Why didn't you do something? And I want to have an answer. I want to go, well, hang on a second. Like, you know, I, this is what I was trying. I can't answer for the world, but, yeah. but this is what I was trying to do. Because I think so I'm, I'm holding, I'm using them to hold myself account to my actions today. Because I think they will quite rightfully it, it be interrogating my actions when you know when they're my age and as right they should be. So, um, and with the other good thing about it is Robert and Dan. Robert who runs or owns the, the kind of channel of the company, and Dan who who's the big kind of head producer, if you will, for the for the channel. If I've got an idea, I phone up Dan and say, "Mate, I've got an idea," and Dan says, "Yes or no." That's it. Whereas like the BBC, it can take years of various levels of yeah, red tape. Yeah. And group. Yes. You know, yeah. It's just nice. You get you get a mad idea. You go, mate. I've got an idea. Let's let's do this. He's like, okay, yeah. It's on the board, and it's on the board. So uh, that's nice. Yeah, get that on direct contact. And it's and it is very true what you're saying because I've got, as you're saying, I've got te- teenage sons, and all they watch exclusively is, and even my ten year old daughter now, is YouTube, and they don't think it's it's well, it's, it's like, YouTube and inverted commas like you're saying. You know, I'm I think we're all about the, roughly ages with each other. Um, and I used to watch, think of YouTube as it was silly videos of people falling over and viral yeah. clips and do, do you know what I mean? Whereas now it is, yeah. there's, there's, as you were saying, Chris, yeah. some cracking content out there, um, well, n- not least this podcast. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I mean, the, 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 the production levels on, on Fully Charged are higher than, than the one show, to be honest, they are. They were, mm. so, um, and yeah, you know, again, I, I used to think of YouTube as the place where people put GoPro clips, which, to be fair, originally it it was mostly it was, like, mostly yeah, 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 it was um, but but now you know, fully charged is is a TV company. It's a TV production company who's that, that are making programs for their own channel. So you yeah. know, normally how it works with BBC, for example, you've got a, 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 a production company will make a program for the BBC. You know, the BBC makes some in house, but but not that much anymore. But yes, you've got this. You know this this television production company who exclusively make content for a channel that they just happen to also own as well. You know, um, yeah. If you, so, if you uh, think about if you, if if you think about the idea of just um, you know when we were kids and you used to if there's a program you have, you know just um, you know but it's you know, still on but you know we used to what I used to love watching Top Gear from way back in the day. But you have to sit and go right okay it's on at eight o'clock on a Sunday. I have to be in the house at eight. What is that? That idea now to you know a sixteen-year-old kid seems stupid. Like, what? Why? Well, you have to be in the house. Like, when it's on to well, no? Why don't I just go and watch it when I want to watch it? Like, the idea seems really like so old-fashioned now. It's it's kind of funny um, compared to YouTube, which is just yeah. I'll watch it then. Well, it's me, you know. I yeah. I, I say I've 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 not like my my TV's not connected in aerial. Like, I've not watched. TV, no, no, I, I don't have an aerial. I don't right have an aerial. I watch everything via Apple. Yeah, yeah, everything's on Apple TV for me. Everything. I mean, even even um, I've not watched it yet. But the Disney Disney Plus, the, this TV series called The Mandalorian, which did very well. I haven't watched it yet. But when I thought, oh, I might I might look at that. So um, then I realized, oh, it's, it's put they put an episode out every week. I was like, oh, well, you know, bollocks to that. I'm, I'll uh, I'll wait until it's all been shown. Then I'll because you know, we're, even I become so used to. If I watch the TV series, I want to watch episode one, two, three. And if I want to watch four or what, you know, whatever, I'll watch it on my terms. And um, but funnily enough, my my oldest, this is probably last year actually, when he would have been about four, to be fair. Um, I was telling about He Man, and he I said, he was oh, I really loved to watch He Man. So I was like, oh, uh, okay, not in a, it'll be on YouTube because everything's on YouTube. And we found it on YouTube, all all clips of He Man. Um, so we press play, and off at the start, there's a five minute, you know, the advert before you can skip it. And he said, "This is not human, Dad." I said, "No, no. I said, this is this is an advert." And he said, "What's an advert?" <laughs> <laughs> because he watched stuff on Amazon Prime, on Netflix, or on BBC iPlayer, 
you know, for yeah. like the last year or two when he started watching telly. I don't know. But obviously, he, he, so he'd never seen an advert. And if he had not shown him YouTube, he could have gone his entire life without ever watching an advert. You, you know, that's, crazy. that's, like, that's hilarious. Yeah. It's like, you, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Hilarious. You don't really. You know, again, even for me, YouTube's probably the only time I see advertising because. So with Netflix or Disney Plus or Amazon Prime or iPlayer, it, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the last. I don't know the last time I watched, you know, Channel One to Four. I don't, not something yeah, I ever watched now. You you just get things on YouTube. Yeah, it's changed yeah. so much. It's funny you're talking about Mandalorian and them dropping an episode a week because I've just been. I'll be. I've watched Mandalorian because I'm a big Star Wars fan, much to Chris's disgust. <laughs> and uh, I've just been watching the uh, Last Stand, the Michael Jordan documentary. Oh yeah, yeah. And they dropped that two episodes a week, and I actually liked that because it felt nostalgic to when I watched basketball in the nineties. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm so used yeah, to yeah. like say, binge watching all twenty four episodes appear at once. Yeah. And you can do six episodes take a break, but that was kind of nice to have to wait, like get to the end of the second episode and be like, "Oh man, I need to wait a week." It, it, it was almost mm. like that nineties feel, but I appreciate yeah, yeah. it. A nostalgia point of view was quite, it was quite nice in a roundabout way. Yeah. But you, you see, even even us, so we're we're behind, but we're we're not used to it. But the kids like come up now, my kids, and, and you know, even the sixteen year olds, the idea of 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 like being out of it breaks or not being able to pause TV, you know, or <laughs> you know, not yeah. getting like box sets at once, is just, and you can see that actually in productions, you know, because um, with the value of, I mean, TV series were always like dirt cheap compared to movies, not anymore, you know. Um, the Mandalorian, Witcher, maybe that's one, but the Marvel, some of the Marvel TV series that kind of coming out. That they've commissioned a, a Lord of the Rings TV series. That I think it's for Netflix or Amazon. Anyway, ten, ep- ten one-hour episodes filmed in New Zealand. Ten one-hour episodes, a one billion pound budget. It's the one hundred million pound budget per episode. That's Jesus. like a oh yeah. That's a, that's the sort of it's all the back of Game of Thrones during the success of Game of Thrones. But that's the sort of level that. In very commas, TV, i.e., Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney, have now gone to that. Again, TV is on a par with, with movies. And that's why you get so many Hollywood A listers who are doing tele programs now, you know? Um, mm. So, it's somebody, that, somebody that does sort of, you know, still sort of terrestrial TV stuff, do you think there's like a long term? Do you think that's still a long term thing that there will be, you know, 20 years' time, will we still be making programs for? BBC One, BBC Two, or, you know, is that something that you think will still happen? Or mm, I, I think long term you'll find that the the BBC becomes an app. So you'll get, you know, the iPlayer will be like YouTube or Prime Plus or Disney mm. Plus, you know. So so you'll go to you'll go to the, the iPlayer and you'll search for dramas and they'll give you the dramas rather than try to find BBC One. Which and, I mean, they 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 may well still probably have a a live element but you'll go to a live element you'll go to the iPlayer and you'll click on live and see what's happening they might have like six channels I mean like you do the Olympics remember the Olympics you could do the red button yeah. thing and you, yeah, you the button. Button. Yeah. there's like five different sports you could watch live because a lot of stuff going on at the Olympics at once there's like you know the horse riding in one place but then there's the gymnastics in another place um, so uh, you know I mean the, the days of the days of BBC 1 to I mean BBC 3 is doing really well and it's been online for years now, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so no, I, I think I think the BBC will still exist. It'll still do stuff, but I think it it, it, it won't be terrestrial anymore. It'll be. It'll have to change basically. It'll have, it's to, going to, yeah, have it'll to change. It'll, it'll get left left miles behind. You know, it'll well, be, the classic uh, example. Be... We're to- the classic example is we're talking Netflix. Now we're all old enough to remember Blockbuster. We we'll, most of them we're all enough to remember the the TV show with Bob Hope as Blockbuster, but I'm talking about oh, yes. the DVD and VHS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bob, 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 Blockbuster. <laughs> yeah, gonna have a piece Bob and all that. But you know, you think of Blockbuster. How many of us, when we were growing up, used to love going on a Friday night to get our DVD VHS, even if we're going properly? VHS. Old yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Always Very rewind. Funny. Don't get to rewind. That, but that we would never think. And Blockbuster themselves. Blockbuster themselves had the chance to buy out Netflix. Netflix needed seed money, offered up 50% of the company and offered to change the name. And the chief exec of Blockbuster said, nah, there's no future in streaming TV. <laughs> <laughs> hindsight. Yeah. hindsight. Hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? But, 
But he's kicking himself now. Um, I mean, I, but then again, I, because I'm not technologically that 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 au fait, um, if somebody had pitched Netflix to me even the year before it came out, I'd be like, how the hell does that work? Because, because it yeah. is wizardry. I mean, it is wizardry. The internet is wizardry. Like right now, you've got three blokes sat in like, hundreds and hundreds of miles apart. But we, I, could be, I could be sat in Sydney, Australia right now. And yet we are, we are mm. video conferencing and we could be what to be broadcasting live to the world. You're like, but where, where's it is? How, how, how does that work? How does the signal get crunched into little numbers and it goes in a wire? I mean, it's, it is wizardry, right? It's beyond. I just don't I hope, get that, it. I hope, I hope that's rhetorical because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. Yeah. We just, yeah. I say most, you know, most people take it for granted, and you know, and you're like, you wish we were like, funny. how's the internet work? Well, it's all saved on the cloud, right? What's the cloud? Well, it's just, it's just, it, it's what? It's, I mean, what magic. physically, magic. It's, yeah, it is. It's magic. Well, that's uh, the, is it, is it Isaac Asimov or something like that who um, said any a, any technology that's suitably advanced will appear as magic? You know, because like, if, if you don't see people Arthur C. Clarke, sorry, Arthur C. Clarke said it, yeah. Um, you know, because if you took, if you took the internet back to, even like, frankly, like, you know, Victorian times, you, the, you, you know. I was talking to my friend, I was talking to my friend about this the other day, actually, um, and we were saying, you know, talking about, you know, an iPhone 10 or whatever you've got now, um, he went, if you explain this to somebody in, you know, 1950s, and you've got this kind of plastic thing, and it fits into your pocket, and, it, you know, it, you can use it to phone people, and, send messages and, and this you know you can send messages internationally and you can ask it questions and it'll tell you you can play music on it it takes cameras it's a video camera it's a map a compass they'd be going fuck off yeah. <laughs> wasn't it wasn't it the uh, the first iphone had a had contained more computer power than all the and there's like there was many 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 rooms of, of computers that launched for the NASA. Uh, Apollo mission. Neil Armstrong in space, yeah, the yeah, first Apollo yeah. mission. Yeah, yeah. Um, you so. know, and, and I've seen <laughs> photographs of these huge banks and banks and banks of computers, and that it was like, you know, I don't know. An iPhone's more powerful. Yeah, well, that's well <laughs> kilobytes of power, and you know, an iPhone's. Yeah. But things, if you think about the May 50s, sorry. No, you if, if, if you take the iPhone back to the uh, to the uh, to the to the 1950s, you'd also to say, oh, and it can send emails and surf the net, and they'd be like. You then have to explain the internet to them, and that yeah. is a concept that I can barely get my head around. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know. I know. No, that's why I was just going to say. Even you're talking the fifties. I'm thinking eighties because I remember playing as a kid yeah. in the woods, imagining I had a device that did all this, and <laughs> our kids are going to have them. My kids do, and they're going to go. It's just totally normal to them to to do all that, which is just crazy. And then and then you think your kids, Andy, if they're like kind of toddlerish age. In ten years' time, when they're teenagers, where's it going to be at that stage? When you think, you know, the iPhone is just over ten years old, and how yeah. much it's changed the world, or, or smartphones generally. So, in ten years' time, when your kids are my kids' age, we're going to be left well behind, I'm afraid, mate. <laughs> and that's why the free part for these cars is really interesting because the, um, you know, you start looking at the technology that's possible, and you realise, you know, we are going to have uh, fully electric cars in the next. 10, 15 years, we're going to have electric, well, they're already electric, small electric passenger planes operating in Canada, but, you know, we'll have electric Boeing 747s in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, you know, there'll be, there'll be, because the whole kind of, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago about fossil fuels, I was like, there's no, until, until we run out, they're not going to stop it. But now, like, I think we actually are, because, the technology is there, and most of these things are better. Like the torque and the power and the acceleration on an electric car is better than a conventional car. And yeah, I, I, I think I'm like, right, actually, we, we will be there'll, be there'll be no combustion engine cars on the British roads unless you've got a special permission because it's a classic car, something like that, you know. By say, by, say by 2030, both say 2035, but I would suspect by 2030, by the next 10 years. You know, in our lifetime, we will see the world radically change, and I think for the better. Um, yeah, I don't, well, say that. I mean, no no generation will have seen as much technological change, I think, as ours, um, mm. because 
what will happen is our, our kids will see stuff that's built on, like the internet might prove it, but yeah, like we were around pre-internet and pre-mobile phone. Like, because like I said, I think the difference between 1990 and 2010, that's 20 year span, is enormous. You know, bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> it is, bonkers, it's crazy yes. what, we've, what we've all gone to. Talking about speed there, Andy, you're talking about the speed of the mm. uh, electric cars. Tell us how you managed to jump out of a plane with engines strapped to your feet to travel at 250 yeah. miles an hour. How did that <laughs> situation come around? Because so, that, that was that just sounds, we're, talking about, we're talking about internet sounding baffling. That sounds baffling to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was that was one of my better ideas. Um, <laughs> so I got into speed skydiving uh, quite a few years ago. So just look, for people who know, speed skydiving is a, it's a very niche sport. Very niche sport. In fact, I was meant to be um, I was meant to be competing for Team GB uh, this August in Russia at the, at the Skydiving World Cup, uh, but that's been cancelled because of COVID uh, nineteen, which is a bit gutting because you know you don't often get a chance to you know, compete for Team GB, especially you know when you're when you're in your forties. But anyway, I'm hoping that we keep the same team makeup for 2021, so I can I can sneak back in there. But anyway, speed skydiving is it's the simplest sport in the world. You you jump out of a plane. Um, the person who goes fastest wins. Uh, you go head first. We found <laughs> found that the head, head first is the is the most aerodynamic uh, position, so that gives you more speed. And um, I mean, I've done about two seven two two hundred and seventy eight miles an hour, but um, I've got my, my, my mate uh, Mikey Lovemore, who's who's the ex world champion and British champion. He's done about three twenty, and I think there's a lad from Sweden who's current world record world. A record over, but he's done uh, over, over that three, three thirty, three forty um, miles an hour. So it's yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty. It's the fastest human power sport in the world. Um, although I can't, um, well, gravity I, assisted. I can't, I can't think. I can't think of something that I'm more interested in, but less likely to do than jumping out of a plane <laughs> and trying to hit three hundred miles an hour. Like I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I can't think of something. There's no amount of money that can get me to do that. I bet it is. I bet it has an amount of money. Yeah, I guarantee you, there's a there's an amount of money. It might be quite high, but it's there. Um, yeah. So getting back to this, Rock. So when I because this I did this TV series for for, for children's BBC called Beyond Bionic, where it was kind of the idea was to look at wildlife and technology. So you took a really cool animal, talked about that cool animal, and then see if I could match it using technology. So the peregrine falcon is the fastest animal in the world. It does 252 miles an hour, uh, head down towards its prey. Think of a stoop, but it dies towards its prey. So um, I was like, right, let's let's try and beat that. And we thought the way to do it, but still and get involved with technology, was uh, and a friend of mine who works for like the UK space industry designed these prototype um, electric like t- jet engines. Um, which is my first sort of an electric vehicle because we were already looking at proper jet engines, and I realised we have to put a bladder of aviation fuel around my waist and set them, and we have to heat them up in the plane and the, the drop zone. And the pilot was like, "You're not turning on jet engines inside my aircraft. That's that's this that's the same." <laughs> and I was like, I was like could, we hang it that, "Could we hang it at the edge of the plane and then turn the engines on, let them warm up, and I jump?" And then this thing about fuel, like having this big bag of fuel around your waist, like this is not so anyway. If the guy from the space, my mate from the space industry said, oh, well, I could design electric ones. It's like, okay, that's super, you know, it's, it's, well, well, that's safer anyway. So, um, yeah, the idea with these little jet, jet turbines, I just jumped out, I go head down, I start picking up the speed, and then I had a bite switch, because my hands are down by my sides to kind of guide me a little bit. So we have a switch that we normally use for operating cameras when we're in skydiving. Um, and it's very simple, you know, bite down for on, release for off. So you bite down and they, they kick in and give you an extra thrust. And, um, yeah, that's what we did. There you go. That's, that's how I ended up jumping out of a plane with them. Um, to type jet engine cats. No, I'll, I'll stick to figuring out how to fight big cats. <laughs> <laughs> it was good fun. It was, I love hey, that. I skydive, you know, no, skydive shoots are really, really pretty chill because... Like you got the T, you got the direct to the camera, and so it's all quite well. Got, you know, it's a bit bustling, and it's this, that, next thing. But the only two people up there were myself and my mate, Mike, Mikey, Mike Lovemore, who I said before was the ex-world and UK 
speed skydiving champ, and he's also my main skydiving partner, and he's a professional skydiving cameraman. So he's my and and I get I get more power than you normally would as a presenter to dictate who is filming it because actually you know, like it's a very mm. small pool. I'm like, well, I, I know a guy to use, or for cave diving, I also use a guy called Rich Stevenson. This is the guy I use. Um, he's my mate as well because we work together, and it's and it's in, it's safe. You want something you know is can do the job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so a CV, you know. Anyway, yeah. so it's me making the plane, and it's you know normally a, a jump plane's packed with like twenty bodies packed into a jump plane. We get the whole plane to ourselves, just me, him, the pilot. We're chilled out. We go up there, you know, open the door, have a look out. Hey, good to go. Yeah, mate, good to go. And then you know you go you go jumping with your mate. So I, I enjoy skydiving shoots because the, the press is on you. You got to do certain things, but um, but they're quite they're quite they're quite nice to do as well. So what 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 kind of because um, I, I like I like I'm a car guy and I, you know I like F1 and racing and all that kind of stuff. So what if you're jumping out you know to get you know the maximum speed is this a lot to do with your suit? Is a you know, are you trying to get certain angles to create speed to get you know is that how yeah. you're creating it? Or? Your what you wear has a bit of um, but what what you wear can create more or less drag definitely, but it's all about body position. Um, so the the the, the, the the straighter you are, the less drag you create, the faster you'll go, the more you'll accelerate. Um, because you know, speed is mass over drag. I can't, I can't be any heavier. And it's against the rules to put on extra weight. So the only thing you do is, is reduce your drag. The problem is the the less drag you have, the less stable you are, less control you have. So it's a bit like trying to balance a pencil on its tip. You know what I mean? So mm. if you're going like that, now you might put your arms out to try and stabilize yourself. You know, but then you're Create and drag. So when I first started, I found I could go faster wearing baggy trousers because although they were creating drag and slowing me down, they were acting a bit like the, the shuttle, you know, a shuttlecock or the feather yeah, of yeah. an arrow. Okay, and, makes sense, yeah. You know, I was I was more stable, so I was keeping more upright. Whereas if I was super slick, I was going faster and then I'd, oh, I'd fall, I'd, I'd constantly fall off, like, you know, run, try to stay there. So um, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a compromise between stability and, and and speed really yeah because if you if you if you go unstable what tends to happen is you end up oh, falling into that normal skydive position which you kind of you know belly to your ground you know big what you see people normally skydive and that's nice and stable and that's how your body wants to go so you're trying to stop that because as soon as you do that you slam the anchors on and the jumps over pretty much so uh yeah it's, it's um that's, so, that's the game yeah I'm, I'm one of these people who when i was kids I'd probably still do it. It's when you're driving along and it's windy, you put your hand out to try and figure yeah. out the angle that would create. I'm one of those guys who are kind of, oh, oh this, this is the angle for a wing that you would use. That's, that's, that's that fascinates me. Yeah, it's that's fascinating. Still, that's, I like it. You, you learn that straight away when you first start skydiving and you, you're falling like belly to earth like that in that sort of position. If you take your hands and do that, you, mm. you, you spin in place. You know, you spin uh, the other way. So that, you, actually, you just use your hands exactly as you would do at the car window to turn yourself. Um, so this must. So I'm assuming that must create like a low pressure for you to fall into or something. Is that how it would work? No, I think it's, it's deflection. Uh, right, of the relative okay. wind. So right, because okay. you're 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 falling down, the relative wind is going up at you. So you're you're mm-hmm. you're you're, you're, chained, you're you're deflecting off the relative wind. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. We actually we actually um, Ali, Ali has a friend who's an engineer for Red Bull Racing. Um, okay. But he could he couldn't come on for contractual things. He's not allowed to talk about anything F one. But I was one of the ones <laughs> I was really looking forward to. I would love to talk to him. But um, but I, so what, how did how did the, the the bond stuff come around about? Is that something you were approached to do, or did you apply for it? Or no, that, it was it was you know life is peaks and troughs. Obviously, you, you put you put your um, put your happy face on Instagram, you know, because you you don't want to. Some people do, and I, I I do tend to try and give people a bit of realistic insight. But at the same token, I don't want to be on Instagram every day just whinging about stuff and bringing folk down, mm-hmm. you know. So I don't want to see it myself, so I don't I don't I don't, I don't do it to the people. But you know, life peaks and troughs. So you know, 2018, sorry, 17, great year. Uh, we did this children's BBC series that was when we all see amazing. You know, became its own computer game, all that sort of stuff. Hey, 2018. A couple of projects fell through, a couple of commissions that were supposed to be commissioned. There was a change at the, the head of the channel, one at Night to you or BBC, and, and therefore they just get, oh, we don't want that anymore. We've changed our mind, we want something else. Uh, and you 
I've just I've worked for a year and it gets pretty stressful and pretty because you never know mm. if the phone's ever going to ring again. You know, and you're like Christ. And a friend of mine, Rich Stevenson, actually the guy that I do a lot of the cave diving, deep diving film with the cameraman. Mm-hmm. He said, I've got, I've got a job in in, uh, in February. In fact, it's, it's February 2019. Still staying around the bar on a bad year. It's like, this is, this is not great. And he said, um, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a diving job, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not presenting. It's not inspecting. You, it's, 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 it's doing underwater construction and safety um, on a film. But um, they need specialists, and he, he's up there filming it. He said, oh, I, I said, we need a guy who can use rebreathers, who, who can dive under ice, who can spend like four or five hours a day in zero degree waters and can cope with that and is like kit for it and all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, they, they were like, okay, fair enough, who, who do you want? And they're like, well, this is the guy you want. So he called me up and said, you know, do, do you want the job? It's three weeks in Norway, working, and some of the other guys who were mates of mine is, you know, it's, you know, up in a nice hotel, money's decent. I was like, mate, you know what? 100%, that, that's much appreciated. I'll, I'll take that, thanks very much. At which point he could then say, oh, by the way, it's for Bond. Wow, oh, how cool is that? Yes, that's really awesome. <laughs> now, I'd been looking at doing, obviously, I've been doing sort of what you could call stunts for, for documentary, sort of real life stunts, if you will, you know, genuinely mm. doing the things you're doing for the last 10 years. And I've been looking at getting doing more, um, you know, film stunt work. But it's quite a hard industry to sort of break into, or it seems that way from the outside, anyway, like everything else. So, um, at, uh, uh, you know, up in Norway, I thought, and there's a, the sun's going on, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to the, the sort of the dive supervisor who he does a lot of, he's the dive supervisor for loads of films between all the bonds. Um, uh, so I might just we chat with him and see if they ever need any like specialist underwater kind of stunt guys. But before that happened, he approached me because I think he'd heard about the skydiver and the climbing and all that stuff. I do free diving and what have you. He said, "Have you never, never thought about getting into into stunts?" I was like, "Well, actually, it's a conversation I was going to hope to have with you towards the end of the job." And he went, "All right, leave it with me." Next thing you know, the stunt coordinator, who's now a mate, and become a really good mate of mine. Um, the stunt coordinator spoke to me the next day and uh, and said, "All right, you know, leave it with me." And I hear that in TV all the time. It's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> but um, like literally, we did Norway. I got a phone call. Could you come and do some some training with uh, you know, some, some just some free diving diving training with uh, with the, some of the, the cast? Yeah, brilliant. That was a day, another day like that. And then, okay, do you want to um, do you want to come to Jamaica as the underwater stunt specialist? Uh, we're, we're leaving. We're leaving effectively tomorrow. Can you be? At, can you be at Stars at the airport tomorrow? Ready to just fly to Jamaica for a month and be the, the underwater stunt specialist. Like, yep, I'm in. And then from there, because there was climbing stuff and there was there's was sort of military stunts as well, uh, I ended up just staying on the. I ended up doing basically the whole year on uh, on on Bond as uh, stuntman, and that was and that was that, and it was uh, it was exactly as cool as you think it is. I've got to say, sounds sounds cool. Yeah, it was. That sounds I'm, cool. Yeah. I mean, people think, oh, yeah, I bet the reality... No, the reality was actually brilliant. It was exactly as cool. I think, but what, what genuinely what made it was the people. Um, now, I'm sure not every film's like this, but I think because Bond is, is a family business, it's, it's been in the family for, well, since it started, and it's the same mm. people, like the, the head of special effects, is a lovely, lovely bloke, but he's been the head of special effects, I think, for the last, like, 16 Bonds, something like that. He, he did, I think he did Roger Moore's last one, and he did the Timothy Dalton ones, he did all the Peace of the Orson ones, and now all the Daniel Craig ones. So he's been the head of specific. So, you know, it's a family thing. Mm. And it's also because it's Bond, they can pick and choose who they hire. So they don't, if, if somebody's yeah. a dick, they don't hire dicks. And they, they, again, the, the stunt team were just, because I, 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 I knew no one when I got on that plane in, uh, in Stansted. And by the time we'd landed, like, we're all just really good mates, just a, a, a very, super motivated, super capable. But just really nice people as well who are just happy mm. to be doing their job and I can appreciate what what they've got. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was uh, make a make a huge difference if you if you know if you're surrounded by nice people who are, who are just friendly and welcoming. It makes so much a difference to, to anything. Doesn't matter what you're doing. I, I do say this that I think the happiness is dictated. Well, ninety percent of your happiness is dictated by the people you surround yourself with. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. And you, I would rather if if you if you go and do, you know. I, 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 Take for example in, in, in the, the, the kind of 
stunt analogy. So working on a cheap TV series for minimal money with your mates, you're still gonna have you're still gonna want to go to work. You're still gonna you're still gonna be happy. You're still gonna have a good time, you know. Mm. Versus working on the next big blockbuster for loads of money with just a bunch of absolute dicks, you know. You're going to mm. loathe every single day. Now, you might be making more money, but I'll tell you what, if it's a year-long job, it's going to cripple you, you know. It's just not worth yeah. it, you know. So, yeah, um, definitely not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, you know, I thought, you know, I always think, it doesn't matter, <clears throat> whatever happened, yeah, I'm happiest if I was yeah, on the Isle of Sky, climbing a Monroe in a nice weather going, this is all right. You know, I, I, I could, you know... But I know people who, you know, you kind of get into working offshore at an early age, you know, and they can't ever give that, you know, big money up. And then, but you know, they've got all these nice things and nice cars and nice houses. You go, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, I get to, you know, we do GGS, right? You know, we get to seven o'clock in the morning, we go train with our friends, try and strangle each other, and then, you know, sit and have a blather, and I could go and do things at night. And that's way more valuable to me than, than yeah. money. You know what I mean? It's, well, it's, it's, um, you know, I'll say like I said to me years ago, no one has an epiphany when things are going well. Like this doesn't happen. It, you need the troughs in order to get to the peaks and, and appreciate those peaks. You know, we're not meant to be happy all the time, but it's not. Life is peaks and troughs. It's bad times and good yeah, times. Yeah. But I, t- you tend to learn the best lessons during the bad times. And mm-hmm. one of the things for me is, is you know, I think some people are ch- chasing what they think is success, and it's the wrong thing for them. You know. These days, success is is it's either money, power, or fame. Now, to be fair, I'm not saying that's wrong. If if making loads of money makes you happy, crack on, do that. If being really famous makes you happy, by all means, crack on and do that. But 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 with that shadow of a doubt, the happiest man in the room wins. That's who wins. Mm. Yeah. And if however you've got there, that's fine. But you know, if you're famous and rich and miserable, I'm afraid you lose. You, you do lose. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people in that situation. You know. Like I say, a lot of guys who you know, they get used to making money, and it, you know, it's not that's not something that they want to do. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just not something. Where where where, where I stay, <clears throat> um, in Fife, I get to go up to Loch Leven, you know, um, can Ross, yeah, um, regularly and watch sunset. And there's nothing cooler to me than just going up there and watching the sunset, and then coming home and going, <laughs> life's pretty good. I yeah, couldn't but... think of anything worse than being, you know, offshore or something, making loads of money, but sitting in a cabin, miserable. And, you know, as I say, that that I don't, I don't, I don't say folk. Oh, you know, making money won't make you happy. Some people love making money. They like they like the stuff they yeah, want to break. Sure. That's cool. It's not all that. It's like people being famous or want to be powerful. Yeah. Politician. Again, that's what. It's, but you. But what I think people do wrong is they often pick the wrong thing, thinking that that will make them happy, and it doesn't. Yeah. And they don't like twenty years of doing it and being miserable. Like, mate, it's clear that making you happy. Stop, stop doing it. So, yeah. Fa- find what makes you happy and do that because I say. It doesn't, doesn't matter who's the most famous person, the most powerful person, the most rich person in the room. It's the happiest person in the room that wins. Yeah, yeah. So what? Um, so the military stuff, uh, Andy. Was that that was what was it, underwater bomb disposal? Is that what? I did all sorts. So yeah, I run the army's underwater bomb disposal team. Uh, the navy go well. The army's only get one underwater bomb disposal team because we take care of stuff basically from the high water mark uh, mm. and up. It's basically fresh water. So lakes, rivers, canals, sewers. Unfortunately. Um, uh, I was part of the Maritime Ter- Terrorist Unit uh, for a few years and did airborne bomb disposal. Um, it was a sort of paratrooper and bomb disposal officer. Uh, yeah, did tours, the usual places, Bosnia. I wondered. I, I wondered that point because I'm ex. I'm a Navy brat. My old man was 22 years in the Royal Navy, um, and I know a lot of VOD and CD boys from that yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And I genuinely, when I saw your thing and, and saw Army Underwater, that part of my brain that's Royal Navy just went, Army Underwater? That's not real. It's the Navy that do the underwater. It's the CD boys, the EOD boys that do it. Yeah, but but they, that's, that's, that's the difference. Yeah, because, you know, we... Because they, they deploy from ships. And they are, they are set up to deploy from ships. Whereas yeah. we are set up to deploy from landowners if we have to, or even, you know, part of the Army course. I mean, in typical fashion... The army dive course that's run at the same place the navy course is, it's like six weeks long and it's five and a half weeks of fizz, you know, training and, and a couple of days of diving. It's just all getting beasted around the lake carrying like twin sets of dive gear, and all, all the navy guys look at you going, "Do you not? Do you not do any diving on your dive course? You just do press up <laughs> and runs." Um, 
because you know we are, we are doing stuff like we did we did searches in in the sewers in Basra or maybe you're searching rivers for stuff like foreign put for mines or you're searching lakes just and you know and and you hope you can drive a wagon up there but sometimes you can't sometimes you might have to hump the kit in the last little bit so it's um yeah, yeah it's a different you know it'd be, it'd be great if you could deploy from shit i think it's it's I'd love to be a, e, a Navy EOD diver. It's just uh, so much easier. <laughs> it, sounds, sounds, yeah. it sounds to me like it'd be a little bit too easy for you. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, I, I get seasick. Um, not all the time. That's a slight problem. Yeah, not all the time. <laughs> it's why, you know, um, the the like I don't do a huge amount of offshore wreck diving. If I do, it's like, when's it going to be calm weather? Um, I, some, some days I'm fine, but some days I'm, I'm pretty bad. <laughs> That's why people go, you know, it's one of the big advantages of cave diving. Cave diving is normally done, you know, on, no one gets seasick cave diving. Mm. <laughs> I remember talk, just talking about enjoying your job and like stressfuls and stuff. I remember talking to two of the boys that, that were uh, good friends of my dad that were EODs. And I remember saying to when I got about maybe 15, 16, just as my dad was coming out, I remember speaking to them and having a bit more understanding of what they do for a job and saying it must be the most stressful job in the world being an EOD guy. And they said it's not actually because there's only ever two outcomes. We either get it right or we die. So where's the stress? <laughs> and do you know when you're just like, you're okay, oh, okay, I can. Hundred percent. And you find that, you know, I've said it before and people look at me like, that's just rubbish, you know. And I say this thing and go, oh, well, must be, must be bomb disposal, oh my God. And you go, no, it's quite zen actually. And it yeah. is because it's a bomb disposal officer. Normally you'd have a lower, you'd have a junior officer, like a sick lieutenant or lieutenant, maybe a captain, or you're a senior NCO, a junior sort of senior NCO, you're a sergeant or a staff sergeant. That you know, it's a fairly junior level. And so in Iraq, you are still the subject matter and therefore the commander on site. So you'll have a major of the infantry, and you'll deploy them out to. Put, you'll be phoning up the head of basically the RAF for the whole of southern Iraq to say, I want a no-fly zone over this area. You know, you're punching well above your weight. You got, and you try to juggle a million different balls to get set up, and then finally. You might do your recce, you'll tell your team to prep the kit, and then within the cordon, no one's allowed but you. And you don't take any comms kit down there, so no one can contact you because it would you know, it might set the device off. So once you enter the bubble, do the old long walk. You're in your own little world. So you're like, all this, all this stuff going on and all this, blah, 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 and you step into the zone and you're like, don't. Oh, thank God for that. Right. Oh, and it's quite zen. And so you wandered down, and it was somebody else that said, what you're talking about there, he he made mind put it very well. He went, as far as you're concerned, everything is always going to be going well. <laughs> yeah, because, well, the second, uh, because the second it stops going well, you're not going to know about it. You know, yeah. um, I mean that's we've had we've had a few guys like named in that in minefields with anti personnel, mine was the small stuff. So yeah. it's why we used to um, like deal with World War Two stuff, for example, in you know, places like London, um, the old German bombs were like a thousand pound bombs, five hundred kilos of explosives. You wouldn't wear. People go, oh, why weren't you wearing the bomb suit? Well, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah. you'd be down there like in, in short sleeve, you know, your t-shirt and your combat trousers, and that's it. And you'd be sat on the bomb, you straddling it like a horse, doing them with a the fuse at the front. People go, that's that's reckless, mate. It's a five hundred kilos of explosive. If this yeah. thing goes off, you know. I could be wearing a tank and it's not going to make a difference, you know, so uh, yeah. I might as well be comfortable. <laughs> yeah. I was interested when I saw that. I did wonder how the army underwater worked when um, yeah. I just I just assume CDs and cleaners divers and EOD boys for the Navy, yeah? Yeah. No, uh, you had the other side. Basically, yeah, fr so, fresh water. Was, you know. So what's, um, what, what is, it, is, there, is there anything else that you have go, moving forward that you, you really want to, to try or study or, or get into? Is, it, is there anything else in the because you've well, not got quite enough already. I know, I, I do. Um, <laughs> Jenny, that's the one problem is I do have, it's, it's hard to maintain a decent level. At, I, 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 I my diving's always up there, but like my free diving peaks and wings, my climbing peaks and wings, my skyving peaks and wings. So my diving's always good, like cave and, and technical diving stuff. But of the other, I, mean, I, I used to do a lot of sea kayaking, but you, you can't, you can only maintain a high level of, I'd say, two things at once and then everything else has to drop down in they change depending on the priority but um we've got fully charged i have a bit more bbc stuff uh, i'm i'm hoping to do more stunt stuff we've got a couple of films maybe happening this year depending on what comes with covid um and and i'm loving that it's just because it's, it's a really it's a lovely environment to work with and be really nice people 
Um, so for that, I've I've I used to do a bit of martial arts as a kid, but I've taken that back up. So that's I'm okay. studying martial arts again, and uh, and I did a little bit of gymnastics when I was a kid as well. So again, I'm getting back into that for uh, for the stunt stuff. So yeah, I'm, which is which is the nice thing about lockdown. I'm just training a lot, like I'm, yeah. fit, I'm training every like every morning, like physical training in the gym, and then I'm doing at least an hour in the afternoon either free diving training, like breath breath hold stuff out of the water or i'm doing martial arts stuff or i'm doing gymnastic stuff so um yeah it's it's um it's sometimes you think yeah just i need a day off but um <laughs> yeah a bit relentless but yeah mind. i can imagine so uh, what's the what's the what kind of martial arts are you doing what's the uh taekwondo that's what i'm doing oh, okay um, cool. yeah i used to do taekwondo which most people there's like five taquito clubs in the world they're all in scotland actually taste yeah, okay. Institute here. i think there's, there's one in aberdeen I think a couple in glasgow of course there's a couple one in dundee one in edinburgh but yeah it's, it's quite a spirit to do that but that's it's very similar to, to taekwondo because it's a korean i think it was born from taekwondo so plus my, mm. there's a local club to me that are really good and what what we managed to do is even before COVID, when i was at the, towards the end of bond last year and i was in italy I was doing remote one to one, basically Zoom wasn't Zoom or using uh, Skype, I think it was, but to do one to ones with my instructor. So actually, when All COVID right. kicked in, I was like, "Well, that's fine. We've done it before, so we've been training kind of over the, over the internet like that." So that's so mm. it's, even when I'm away, I can still train and, and kind of still hit my gradients, which is nice. Um, yeah, yeah, less so with the gymnastics because again, it was really handy as well, just down. In the, the town near me is this big gymnastics centre, but uh, they've obviously had to close for uh, yeah. the time being. Gymnastics is one of those things where I, I, I really wish that I could um, spend some more time trying to do it. It's some, one of those things that seems so like, outrageously strong. You know, it's, yeah. the guys just seem crazy strong, crazy flexible, it just seems madness. That's my problem is flexibility. You know, too many, yeah. the, the force is very much you rock up and then no warm up, you, you rock up. You stick a pack and you're wearing boots. You run up a mountain, you run back down the mountain, and then you just go for a beer. Like this the idea of stretching or you know mobility work is like for what? So I'm, I, um, I'm, at, I'm yeah. at the stage in life now where I can't do anything without a solid bit of stretching. At the night, I need to do some warming up now, or nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Nothing at all. <laughs> um, are you are you okay for for time, Andy? Are you? Uh, I'm going to put the kids to bed actually in about. Five or ten minutes time. So I was going to say, yeah, we've gone over there, so we appreciate your your That's time right. and we'll oh, right. let you go. On anything you want to add, Chris, just before we hang up. Oh, did that freeze you? I'm just saying, anything you want to add on? Uh, myself, uh, yeah. Uh, no, not not. I mean, it's been, it's been a good chat. Uh, you know, I'll um, if it's still going a year's time, I'll I'll pop back and give you an update. We can. Uh, this, this, Absolutely, we'd love that. Beautiful. Um, 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 if anyone's looking for you on social media and that, where can they oh, find you, Andy? Uh, um, Andy Torbett. Uh, website is andytorbett.com. I think on Instagram, I'm Andy Torbett. Uh, I wouldn't bother, or, or I've not been on Twitter for years, so I think I'm still on there, but I wouldn't bother following me on Instagram. So Instagram's probably the best way to do it. And yeah. um, apart from that, uh, yeah, I hope everybody's doing all right and, and, and safe up in Scotland. My mum's been, my mum's still in Aberdeen, so she's been keeping me posted on, on how things are developing there. But I think it's pretty much the same across the country. Although yeah. I think probably the safest place to be right now is probably, you know, the the Isle of Harris or something like that. <laughs> you know? Aye, somewhere up in the west, <laughs> I would say. I know. Yeah. Proper uh, isolate. Yeah. But no, thanks well, uh, very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate thanks. it, Andy. Thanks for taking the time. It was fantastic. Yes, guys. Thank you. Take care. Good. Thanks. Just stop recording now. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.